Welcome to the Wall Off Podcast, where the goal is to motivate, inspire, and share success principles. I'm your host, George Almasri. Ryan Carr is a full-time real estate investor and specializes in finding the highest and best use of real property. He also coaches others to do the same. Ryan has been known in the past for his knack at finding hidden opportunities, and he's the author of a new book relating to land development and construction. On this episode, we discuss land planning, Ryan's new 33-unit project, breaking down a double triplex new build, and discussing his 14-unit project in Belleville. Finally, we talked about partnerships with investors, why or or why not his take on partnerships in general. I hope you guys will enjoy the episode. Make sure to leave us a five-star review. We are really trying to get to 100 reviews by the end of the month, so your support is appreciated. And also, if you want to download some free, cool reports, you can go to www.welloff.ca forward slash report. There's a whole bunch of stuff there, like a sample letter of intent. We've got a multi-unit renovation operations order guide. And then also why you shouldn't be investing in places like Oakville, Burlington, and other cities in the GTA. So again, you can go to welloff.ca forward slash report to download these free reports. And there you go. Enjoy the episode. All right. I'm here with Ryan Carr. Ryan, I think this is the second time we get together on the show. It is, yeah. Uh, First time was before a Durham REI meeting, which is a group that we're both a part of. And I think we were sitting in like a greenhouse with huge fans <laughs> we were. above us. It was one of the first episodes I ever recorded. So, you know, the sound quality was not great for that episode, but today should be a lot better. I love it. Thanks yeah. for having me. Um, so just kind of, uh, I know you've been on the show before, but it's been a couple years. So why don't we just give people a bit of a background on who you are and what you do? Who am I? Okay. So uh, Ryan Carr, 35 years old. Uh, I've been investing in Durham primarily and and, uh, and East uh, in the GTA for the last, I guess, 10, 12 years, since 2012. I uh, bought my first property in 2012, which was a bank sale property. Bought my first rental property about six months later. Uh, I was previously a mechanic in a prior life. And uh, during that time, I was working on houses evenings and weekends, and then I got laid off. So my, my transition into real estate at that point, which was... Uh, I guess in 2013, 2014, somewhere in there full time, um, was after the mechanic thing was done. And my wife said, Hey, you know what? Don't go be a mechanic anymore. Go, uh, go do some more real estate. You're good at that. So yeah, that basically brings us to, uh, being a full-time real estate investor, which carries us through to today. That's almost 10 years ago. I know, man. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so you're known for the, being the highest and best use guy. So you've got your, <laughs> your podcast, you've got a book, you've got all sorts of information on, on that. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. What does it mean? Uh, what does that term mean? The highest and best use to me means the most profitable, productive, or efficient way to get something done somehow. Mm-hmm. Right. And there's lots of ways that you can describe highest and best use, like legally permissible or maximally efficient, things like this. But the way that I interpret it is, is as such. And I really realized that I'm going to say five, six, seven, eight years ago. Right. And I didn't, even, I didn't even know what the highest and best use term was at the time. I just knew that I was trying to optimize everything that I was doing. Right. To actually, you know, be most efficient for time or make the most money or to have the best tenant experience, this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, and later on in my career, I realized, okay, this highest and best use thing that I've heard about, how can I kind of package all of the stuff that I was doing under this one umbrella, right? So that I can actually call it something like, how do I give it a name? You know, like people have careers as doctors and lawyers and accountants and all this, they're, they're that thing, right? Yeah. How can I give this a name? So the highest and best use was born. Yeah. Um, and just to kind of uh, break that down into more of a, an actual example, can you mm. tell us of how you've gotten potentially properties to their highest and best use in your, in your own portfolio or even with clients of yours? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, uh, I've done about 70 properties over my career and all of those have had some form of highest and best use mentality to it. Uh, some of which took place before, like I was saying, before I even knew what highest and best use was, and then uh, many of which took place after. So, I mean, I've touched on everything from uh, highest and best use in terms of like construction, like what's the best way to renovate, mm-hmm. right? To, uh, to land planning, to do we tear down, rebuild? Are we doing basement apartments or duplexes? Back in the day when I was doing a lot of duplex conversions, I was doing this thing called the vertical split, right? And I was taking, we'll just use a bungalow as an example. I was taking bungalows that would have otherwise been basement apartment, main floor apartment, and I was putting a wall up the middle, and I was giving each tenant a main floor and each tenant a basement by adding a second set of stairs, right? So when people walked in these properties, they go, oh my gosh, this feels like a full house. And I go, yeah, you get your main floor, right? And you carry your groceries in. And then you get your basement. Maybe that's where the bedrooms were because right. you spend most of your time where the natural light is, right? So that was my that was my first kick at highest and best use uh, in terms of duplexes. And since then, 
uh, it's evolved into, you know, how do we how do we optimize this flip or how do we plan land to get the most amount of density, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, multifamily, how do we, how do we make this the, the best possible use of this uh, existing square footage? Can we add bedrooms? Things like that, they all fall under that highest to best use umbrella. Yeah, just out of curiosity, that vertical split thing, because we did yeah. uh, talk about that when, when you were on the show a couple years ago. Um, why do you think that more investors didn't do that? Or maybe even for yourself, why did you kind of walk away from that strategy, yeah. assuming you did? Yeah. So, I mean, I would still do it today. I've just kind of evolved from the duplex space. Uh, duplexes in general, once you have more than a certain amount of properties, as you know, like they're, they're hard to finance, yeah. right? You can only have so many before the bank says, eh, no more, right? Or you get lots of partners and then you have five with each partner and, you know, you can strategize that way. But I mean, I still think that strategy is very much viable today. The reason that I did it and not a lot of other people followed is because it's, um, it's highly invasive to the property. So I was buying like the worst of the worst properties wherever I could find them. And I had full-time like T4 construction staff at the time. So I'd go in, I'd say, okay, this is how I think we can renovate. We're going to buy the worst of the worst. We're going to empty everything out. We're going to start again. And in saying that, when we put Humpty Dumpty back together, we're going to have this really awesome property. But to take something that's like three quarters done, it's a bit of a crunchy basement, but we could make it work and all this. It doesn't make economic sense to strip it out and start fresh, right? You have to, you have to want to start fresh from the get. Right. right. And that's really what we did. Um, and those are the properties that I was looking for. So that on the backside, it made sense. Right. So you're not going to walk into that like kind of fully finished property and then start putting in a staircase no. and opening things up. No. and all that. Right. It doesn't make sense. No, you gotta gut it and, and start from scratch. Yeah. For sure. For sure. And I mean, we were starting from scratch, but not fully from scratch. So, I mean, like we'd find something with a bit of a like a bit of a crunchy main floor and the basement needed to be fully gutted. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that was good enough to say, okay, we can justify spending an extra 10% in construction, cutting holes in floors, second sets of stairs, and so on, um, to go and rebuild. But yeah, for the, for the most part, if you've got something that's just like a, you know, a non-legal basement and you want to legalize it by ripping the ceiling down and freshening it up a little bit, you're not going to go and gut the house out. Right, right. Yeah. It's a pretty cool concept because I think that we're kind of trending towards that, having these narrow, more narrow properties or just all overall smaller properties. Yeah. So it, it is a it is a really cool concept. And I think that maybe that could work on a larger scale. But um, you said you've kind of moved away from the duplexes. So what would be your focus these days? My focus these days is land planning. So I've been doing a lot of land planning lately. I've got 33 units of new construction in the pipe. So that's really, uh, that's really interesting because... There's a big opportunity if you know how to plan the dirt correctly, right? And you know where to find those deals. Um, alternatively, if you don't, it's going to be such a drain because it's going to be a drag. Uh, land planning and <laughs> development is not a cash flow play. So for anybody looking for cash flow, that's not it, right? You might want to trend towards flipping or, or service mm -hmm. providing, things like that. But I mean, land planning takes one, two, three, four, five years, right? So you have to be able to look in the future and say, oh, if this goes absolutely perfectly, how do my numbers look? Yeah. And if this goes the absolute opposite way, the market falls apart and the interest rates go up and nobody buys my stuff, like, am I in, am I in trouble or am I breaking even, mm -hmm. right? And then from there, you can strategize. So for me, I always say, that I, on every deal, I say the same thing. What is my upside potential and what is my downside risk? Mm -hmm. Every single deal forever and a time, and I will always say that because you need to know, Yeah, this goes really well, yeah. what do I get? If sure. this doesn't go really well, how bad is it going to hurt, right? And if it hurts... Maybe you proceed. If it kills, you probably don't, right? But I always look for the upside first. Yeah. Uh, when you say land planning, is that like taking a lot that's zoned a certain way? Then you go in there and rezone it and go to the committee of adjustments and do all that sort of stuff? Is that cool? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, like the, the profit uh, initiates, like it or originates from the dirt, right? So what you make on the dirt, you make on the deal in a lot of cases, especially with infill. So if you can find a piece of dirt, and you can sever it, and maybe you can keep the house, and then you get a free piece of land. Like, bonus, right? You get a free piece of land. And whatever that piece of land is worth in your city, two, three, four, five hundred thousand, a million bucks, like whatever it is. In Toronto, it's worth more. Uh, up north, it's worth less, yeah. right? So, I mean, if you can find a free piece of dirt, that's great. So, I usually start there. Um, if you can whack it down and you can add more density, that's a big win as well. So, if you're gonna go uh, low rise multifamily, if you're gonna go high rise, rezoning applications, land severances, changing the use is big as well. So maybe maybe you have something that's zoned, I'm looking at a golfer's picture up here on the wall. So maybe you have something that's zoned like agricultural, right? And you know that the urban boundary is pushing out such that maybe this golf course is now gonna become a higher and better use as residential. Maybe you can acquire that golf course as a golf course, right? And then rezone it to become residential. Mm -hmm. 
buy by the acre, sell by the foot, as they say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, now that is that something where you're generally rezoning or changing the use of the land or whatever, and then are you just selling it off to a, a builder at that point, or are you moving forward with with building as well? I'm both. I'm both. So I look at both strategies. Um, right now, with all the land that I'm planning, I'm keeping both options open. So I know that I'm not going to build all of those 33 units this year, mm-hmm. right? Because I just, frankly, I just wanted to take a bit of a step back. You know, and obviously the market is where the market is. Construction costs are up, prices are down. Um, that does definitely have an influence. But I mean, overall, if we track out 10, 20, 30 years, if you keep these projects, the market, the market ups and downs are less important. They're still very much important. Don't get me wrong, right? But they're, they're less or so. Because in 30 years, if you look back and say, wow, you know, I spent an extra 20 grand on my construction budget. Does it really matter? Not so much, you know, when there's lots and lots of equity there. But, you know, in the current all of that money that you spend or don't get back on a refinance is still money stuck in the deal, right? Sure. So uh, to answer your question directly, I'm both. If I'm developing land and I'm going to build it out, I will build it the way that I want it. If I'm developing land and I know that I'm not going to build it out, I will still develop it the way that I want it because I think that I have a pretty good idea of what other people would want. And if I do it the way that I want and I end up getting, you know, air quotes, stuck with it, I know I can still build it and be happy, Mm -hmm. but I know that if somebody else buys it from me, they'll be happy too because they could see it from my lens and I could explain that to them and justify why I did what I did. Yeah. When you're, when you're looking for a a new project, can you tell us a bit of uh, what, what criteria you have? Uh, Are you sticking to a certain area? What are you looking for? How do you make sure that this is going to be a good project? Yeah. Do what you know. For sure. Um, so like if you're investing in Hamilton, do Hamilton. If you're investing in Oshawa, do Oshawa. Um, I primarily invest from Durham Region East just because that's what I know, right? It's convenient. That's where my staff would live or used to live when I had staff. That is, uh, that's where I started, right? It's just, it's just, it's familiar. So that's what I did, right? And that's what I continue to do. And I think that once you start to build your systems around all of those locations, whatever city that may be, all the systems remain the same, right? Bookkeeping, construction, real estate agents, all the service providers that go along with it, you start to compound all of the effects of what you're doing and all those activities upon themselves, mm-hmm. right? What was it like uh, the eighth one of the world, compound interest? Yeah, yeah. The same thing goes for business. Yeah. If you can start stacking those skills on top of each other and stacking your, your service providers on top of each other, you're going to win, right? Mm-hmm. Um, prime example. So when I call the city to talk about one project, well, if I have multiple on the go, I can talk about three or four at the same time. Right. So, oh, I need a I need a sewer install over here. Oh, I need a water pipe install over here. I need a sewer install over here. You know, before you know it, you're tackling three, four, five things all at once with the same person, assuming it's the same planner on the other end. Mm -hmm. Right. With one phone call, whereas normally you have to call or an email. You wait for them to get back to you. You miss the call and you do this seesaw. Right. Which is just a waste of time. Let's cover it all in the same in the same conversation. And it's way more efficient that way. So yeah, and that, that has to do with also having kind of a relationship with uh, with some of these uh, yeah. planners and and whatever else. So this is something that's interesting about that relationships. So even though people look at the city or the the governmental body, whoever whoever the authority is, um, behind that veil are people, and those people that you speak with. Although we do live in a modern time where everything is supposed to be equal. And the building code is the building code and land planning is like, you know, you go by the zoning bylaw and that's it. Like at the end of the day, there are certain judgment calls that people can and do often make right on site based on the circumstance. So like if I've got a sewer pipe going in the ground and I say, you know, this is what's happening. This is how we need to, I think, adjust in order to make this project fly. Sometimes people can say that makes a lot of sense. Let's proceed with that. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas somebody who is a first time or a mom and pop or has no clout or whatever, and they're going in and they're trying the same thing. Sometimes people don't believe in their story. Right. And I've had lots of times where people believe in my story because it's legitimate and I can explain it. And if you can articulate that to somebody in 90 seconds or less, as Kevin O'Leary says, right. It starts to make a lot of sense to them. Yeah. And they say, hey, you know what? This is good. Let's proceed. Yeah. And and speaking of that, so I had a scenario recently where I, I had a, a minor variance hearing for uh, parking because I'm converting yeah. a townhouse and unit townhouse into a duplex. Yep. And um, the, the uh, person on the committee asked, well, have you considered putting parking in the backyard? Because hmm. we have two tandem parking spaces and we were just asking for a variance on the size of the parking spot. 
And then I was thinking that the designer that I'm working with who was representing me was going to come up with some technical answer as to why, you know, we can't do it in the backyard. But he basically said, well, as Canadians, we like to enjoy our backyard in the summertime. It was like totally non technical. Right. That was the answer they were looking for. Yeah. Because he's like, you know, he told me after, I just have to connect with these people. And, you know, th- sometimes they're just going to say no because they don't want to see changes in their town or whatever. Yep. But if you can connect with them on a personal level, you can generally get a, a better result that way. Smart. So makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. I thought it, it was uh, really cool to see that happen. <laughs> Lifestyle. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. We barbecue. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so just going back to these deals. So these pieces of land that you're looking at, first of all, are you finding these on the market? Are you developing relationships with, you know, realtors or whoever else that are getting these opportunities and potentially buying them off market? Mm -hmm. Um, are you generally making like major changes to the zoning or to the use? Just maybe if you can explain a little bit on that. Yeah. So multi-part question, where am I finding deals? We'll start with that. So I'm finding them everywhere. So I'd say Traditionally, historically, I'm 50% on market, 50% off. Mm-hmm. So like I just did a deal where it was a land severance. I bought the house. Um, I split the lot. I kept the house. I ended up with the land and then I sold the house, right? That was on market. It was easy. I did that over the course of two years just because that's how long it took to get the land cut. Um, I bought, <laughs> This one's funny. So I was doing renovations for a guy, which I don't often do, but this was about three, four years ago. And I was doing renovations. I was between projects and because I had full-time staff, I wanted to keep my team busy, right? So I, I, I said to this person, I said, yeah, we'll come and renovate your house. We'll come over and we'll do it. So we were there for a month or something. And I was there on site one day and I was, you know, I was like, I was having lunch. And I thought, you know what? This area is a little bit of a fixer upper area, right? I think it could use some love. I'm going to walk around town while I'm eating my sandwich. And I'm going to hand out flyers on the neighborhood, like on the street, mm-hmm. right? So I'm handing out flyers and there was this one house. It was, it was Robin's egg blue, baby blue, like terrible color. Right. This house is like a hundred years old, not historic, just like just old and tired. And I'm looking at this house. I'm like, damn, I should really drop a flyer. So I dropped a flyer. Two years goes by. Nothing. Don't hear anything from anybody on the street. And I was like, well, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Doesn't matter. So the phone rings and it's a realtor. And this person's on the other end. And he says, is this Ryan? So speaking. And he goes, Ryan, I've got your flyer here from such and such a house. And I said, uh, I remember that house. Yeah. He goes, yeah, this was the, the Robin's egg blue one. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how are you? And we got to chatting and I said like, so what's up? And he goes, well, I have a client. She's in a bit of a situation. We don't want to put it on the market. And she kept your flyer for the last three years. Mm-hmm. Are you still interested? And I said, absolutely. Because I knew that house had different zoning than the rest of the neighborhood. I knew that house was on a big and deep lot. Right. And I knew the house could rent in the short term, but basically it would come down, right? Mm-hmm. So I said, yeah, I'm still interested. I went down there. I said, look, man, this, this house is toast because it was. I said, this is basically a land value play. I'll close whenever you want, right? Whenever your client wants. She had some circumstances that she needed a little bit of money now, but a little bit of money later because she's moving into a condo. So I helped her out with those you know, circumstances and those specifics, and I got the deal. But that was literally a 10-cent flyer mm-hmm. that I put in her mailbox, right? And I still have that property today, and I, I whacked the house in, and I'm putting six units on it. And it was a really creative land planning deal. And, and then, you know, to top it off, at that time, there was no triplex zoning like there is today, mm-hmm. right? So I'm putting six units on it. I'm doing two triplexes side by side because you have more than five units. You can finance that commercially, as everybody knows, right? And by doing that, that's how I'm achieving highest and best use with a lot of these parcels that I'm looking at is by saying, okay, what can I do with the house that's there? Right. What can I do with the density and the zoning and how do I make an opportunity here? Like, what does that mean? So that's, that's how that one came to be. That's, that's a cool story. Um, just, uh, I had a couple of questions as you were speaking, but so do you have, did you have to sever the land to build the two properties or are you just building kind of like one semi that's a triplex on each side? I can do both. I've got a lot of options. So this has compound zoning. So for anybody who doesn't know what compound zoning is, let's just say in your city, and I'll generalize. Let's just say R1 is good for uh, single-family homes. Let's say R2 is good for duplexes. And let's say R5 is good for multifamily, right? This had all of those zonings, mm. right? And I knew that. And when I'm looking at it, I'm saying, okay, I could build singles. I could build duplexes. I could build triplexes because they would fit and the parking would work and the density was there. I also happen to be on a fringe zone of like a downtown urban growth center, right? And when I'm looking at that, I'm saying, okay, I've got all of the government policy in my favor, right? I've got the density and the zoning in my favor. And I think I can do all of this without changing the zoning 
I can just get some variances. Mm-hmm. And doing variances is way quicker than changing zoning, mm-hmm. right? So when I'm looking at all that, I'm like, oh gosh, I gotta have this. This makes sense. Yeah, to yeah. Me. yeah. Uh, can we maybe break down some of the numbers on this? I know like it's still not complete and whatnot, but mm-hmm. maybe just your projected numbers. Yeah, I haven't even built it yet. Yeah, yeah. So yep. you still you don't even like know if you're doing two triplexes or I'll do two triplexes. That's the that's the preferred build form. So yeah. basically, I bought it in the high threes. I think my build cost would be. Because there's a development, I got to think about this like as we go here. So um, I bought it in the high threes. There's one development credit which is worth you know, about a hundred grand, um, which is good. So I have one more DC to pay to build two of those triplexes. I'd probably be, I don't know, six, seven, eight hundred grand somewhere in there, depending on the construction cost at the time. So I mean, if we average that all out, let's just say let's just say seven hundred per triplex. Mm-hmm. Plus servicing and severance, maybe eight hundred. Plus another triplex is seven hundred, so it's like one point five. Maybe I'd be all in for like one point eight. Okay, somewhere in there, right? Including land, and I mean they're probably worth two point two combined, mm-hmm. something like that. So I mean that's this a, is in Oshawa. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. So I mean that's a pretty good deal. And how do you get all the financing for this? Are you going like you know? Mm-hmm. Um, construction financing are you just doing private money all the above i bought the land cash in this case because it was low threes or mid threes or something um so i just bought a cash because i happen to have the cash right i was between deals and i was like oh i got the cash i'll just close on it and because it was kind of a complicated closing it was better to go cash um could i have gone private for sure could i have gone b lender maybe maybe the house was like you know it was tired for sure but it might have financed um, so that was an option, but I just closed cash because I knew what was coming down the pipe was going to be a lot of development and severances. And when, anytime you have financing on a property, especially institutional financing, and you, when you plan land, it becomes very cumbersome, right? Because you have to ask the lender to lift their charge. The lawyer has to say, yes, everything is copacetic. Uh, the city needs to know about it. Like it's just when it's cash, it's easy because it's just you. Yeah. Right. Or if you have a lender that believes in your story, going back to relationship, right. You can say, Hey, Dave, you know, can you like lift the charge so I can go and do my thing and we'll put it back because this is a private mortgage and I can text you at eight o'clock at night. And that person will be like, gotcha. No, no problem. We're good. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I really, I really do prefer that where possible, just the flexibility in terms of development. Yep. Um, what about the, uh, the actual construction? Is that something you're still going to finance yourself or uh, are you going to get loans for that? I don't know. I'm not sure yet. I would probably trend towards construction financing with CMHC um, because I'd roll it into a CMHC product, maybe like an MLI Select when we're done. Um, I think I might build it next year, but this year probably not. So that, again, that takes time. So because time is on my side right now and I'm like, I don't really want to build it. I'm just going to kind of bank the land. I'm going to plan the land. I'm going to build it eventually the way that I want, but that time is not today. Yeah. I have options and options are good. So it's good to go construction financing with the Big Five Bank. The challenge is they're going to want to see track record. So fortunately, I have a track record, right? I've built houses, I've split land, I've done all the things we talked about, mm-hmm. and I can, I can prove that. And it's easy. You can yeah, pull yeah. title and you can see all these different places, or you can just ask me and I'll tell you, mm-hmm. right? But I mean, they're going to want to see a track record. One thing that a lot of people don't know is that when you go and build new construction, if you're using financing from a big five bank or you know, CMHC or, or some variation thereof, they might want you to have a project monitor, right? And a project monitor is basically somebody to hold your hand and say, you're doing this right, you're not doing this right, I think you're on track, I think you're off track, right? right? And that's basically eyes and ears for the bank. Similar to when an appraisal happens, that's your progress report, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That comes at a cost. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and speaking of uh, development projects, so that's a really cool one. I, I love that you had the, the whole story of the flyer a couple years ago, yeah. then it turns into a deal, and then it's gonna turn into six units and all that. Uh, do you have any other kind of development plays right now, aside from that, I guess, the 33-unit uh, p- piece of land that you're working on? The 33 is broken up over multiple titles. So that deal that I just told you, I've got multiples of those mm. on the go. And it's it's kind of cool. Like some people say, go and do the biggest building you can, which I agree with in some respects. Some people say, keep it really small and do a whole bunch. Like you can catch elephants or you can catch rabbits, mm-hmm. you know? And right now I'm doing a little bit of both. And I still have a rental portfolio, which is good. That cash flows, I've done some private lending. So, I mean, there's some cash flow there. Um, obviously, the rental portfolio is more of an equity builder piece than the cash flow just by nature of the way that it works. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, all this new construction stuff, if I built it all out and I added those 33 units to my portfolio, 
you know, assuming those numbers are correct and they're, they're viable with the current market condition when I build it, I mean, I could own all those for free and get all my money back mm-hmm. right, and continue to grow if I so chose. Right, right. And so these 33 units, are they all kind of like, you know, six unit buildings that you're you're putting up or uh, yeah they're flip. like they're like threes and threes twos and twos mm-hmm. uh there's some semi-detached with basement apartments which is effectively a fourplex but it's just split over two titles yep. um but yeah triplexes are great anything that i can finance commercially is going to be the way to grow if i do decide to build these out because i can get it and it's based on the cash flow of the property not based on my income sure right and that becomes the problem as as real estate investors grow is yeah. you know you're house rich and cash poor, or you didn't show any income last year because you depreciated everything, right? And the bank goes, oh, well, you didn't make any money. It's like, well, I did, but on paper, yeah. it doesn't look that way. So. Well, I just had Dylan Suter on on before. Guy's uh, an animal. <laughs> yeah. Guy's an animal. And he was saying how the bank was, because he's got like, you know, dozens and dozens of properties and basically even he can't qualify, even though he makes good income, but sure. it's like they expect you to cover the mortgage on all your your properties, your right. entire portfolio, if tenants stop paying, which is which impossible. is insane, yeah, yeah, impossible. So you have to go commercial, yeah, you have to, yeah. It's and that's the thing. We just had the uh, multifamily conference. Were you there for that? I was not there. Oh, okay, no, yeah. And and um, Dahlia was saying, who's with Streetwise Mortgages, she was saying that there is like this huge influx of people that are interested in commercial multifamily now. All of a sure. sudden, so it, it seems like the next thing everybody wants to to be part of that because the financing is so much easier. Yeah. Um, it's just more of a kind of a professional approach if you're if you've been investing for a couple years, right? Yeah, especially too with commercial. So with a lot of the smaller duplex stuff, because you can kind of mom and pop your portfolio together, which is great, mm-hmm. right? A lot of the times it doesn't factor in the cost of management. And I think that because a lot of people self-manage when they have five properties or less, and they can do that and still work a nine to five job, as you continue to grow, there's a lot of people that forget, oh, I'm running a real business here. Like every one of these houses is a micro business in itself. And when you look at commercial multifamily, they're going to take an expense ratio and they're going to say, hey, we're going to factor in the cost of management because we know you're not managing this thing. We know that, right? It's already built in. That's good. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of um, apartment buildings, so we were touching a little bit on before we started recording your 14 unit in Belleville. Mm. So let's uh, let's talk about that. What was the story behind that? When did you acquire it? Yeah. Uh, how did that come to be? That was an off market deal. So that was through a networking group a friend of mine. She had found this property. She was thinking about closing on it, but wasn't sure. It was a ton of work. Like, oh my God, it was so much work. And she was like, I just don't have the bandwidth to take it on right now. Um, so it was 14 units. It was broken up over a couple of different buildings mm-hmm. on the parcel. There was a couple acres of, um, of land there as well. And she was like, look, I want a $40,000 wholesale fee or something to, to do this deal. And if you're good with that, then come on out and have a look. So I went out and I had a look and I was like, you know what? I'm good with that. Like I can take on this project. The, the construction budget, I think was six or s- Six or some, six or something hundred thousand, six or seven hundred. So like it was, it was lengthy for sure. Um, and we did that over the course of a year. I had to buy out tenants. You know, I had to uh, not evict, but uh, re- request. Hey, if I give you guys money, will you go? And some of them said, Yeah. Like this building needs a ton of work, and we'd be happy to take your money and leave. So that was good. Uh, there was a few tenants that didn't want to go, and I can't force anybody out, so I didn't. And they're still there today, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a big project. We did really, really well on it. Um, like I say, it took a it took a year. Or, maybe two to get the construction all like done, done just the way that I wanted it. But, uh, it was a really great project. So is this something you bought in like 2020, 2021, somewhere in that ballpark? I would have bought this maybe 2019, okay. 2020. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, and I financed it with the VTB through the seller, nice. 83% loan to value at 4% renewable by the buyer. So that was a really good deal. Uh, I did end up renewing it for the second year so we could get our construction done and and do what we had to do and refill the vacancies. And we refied this with CMHC. Get this. Mm. I put a 10-year mortgage, 35 or 40-year AM, a 10-year mortgage I locked in for at 1.9%. Amazing. I still have this today. Yeah, yeah. So cash flow is like a monster. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think there's like eight years left on the term or something. Yeah. And I mean, it's just, it's it's phenomenal. It's it's rental ready and it's it's great and it's updated and tenants are happy. That's awesome. That's, uh, I don't know if you know Casey Wong. Uh, I know the name. Yeah. Yeah. So he was, he was on here too. And he was telling us on the, on the podcast that he, he locked in two or three mortgages in like 2020 at 10 year terms, just like you. Insane. Yeah. And insane. I look like a genius now, but I was just thinking, when are the rates ever going to be this low? I don't know. Right. Maybe never again. So that's what the guy at the bank told me. He's like, dude, let's okay. Let's say the rates drop to 1.7, right. Or, or maybe they go up to 2.2. Like, does it really matter? He said, we're not like, will we ever see rates this low again? Will we, will we never see? I don't know. 
But he's like, look, even if they go to zero, a 2% or a 1.9% interest rate is insanely low historically. Yeah. And I mean, I guess I owe that guy a lunch or a case of beer or something because, <laughs> gosh, he, he was right. You know, here we are at uh, yeah. four and a half to 5% on an MLI select program, six or 7% residentially mm-hmm. right now. So it's, it's up there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's a cool story. So this was um, a property with multiple buildings. And the total is 14 units. Yep. You got it off a colleague of yours that you were, uh, I guess, networking with. Yeah. Paid a little wholesale fee, fixed it up, cash for keys or whatever. Um, I guess an incentive for the tenants to leave. Mm-hmm. And then you refinanced it through CMHC for an incredible rate. Yeah. And there you are. Now you're holding on to it. You're Still cash on. flowing. You're doing well. Absolutely. Um, that's a really cool story. And that was uh, in Belleville. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And do you see yourself moving more into these types of projects or do you just want development, infill, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. I'm an opportunity guy. So because, I, you know, I had somebody on my podcast recently and he said he was the UFC of real estate. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I can, I can kick, I can punch, I can jab, I can do all these things. And I thought, damn, that's pretty smart. I can do that too, right? And, and I'm very much the same way. So because I'm fluent in a lot of different areas of real estate, yeah. if I want a couple of flips, if I want a multifamily, if I want to do some development, that can happen, right? As long as it fits in to all the puzzle pieces on an annual basis for the outlook. Yeah. And I think one thing that we, well, we were talking about this when we had dinner a couple weeks ago before one of the uh, Durham REI events, we we're touching a bit on uh, burnout. So I, mm-hmm. I, I know we didn't really talk yeah. about that before we started recording, but maybe we can, we can touch on, on how that impacted you and, and how that made you kind of shift things. Yeah. So I was looking for a return on time this year. That was my biggest thing. So over the last 10 years of doing what I've been doing, you know, at some point you say, okay, you start to ask yourself, What's it all for? Is it all about the money? Um, is it all about uh, lifestyle? Uh, you know, where does friends and family fit into this equation? You start to ask yourself all these questions because, like, you can't just swing a hammer all day long and not expect to, at some point, say why, how come, mm-hmm. you know, what's the end game? So that, for me, this year is what that was all about is, is really looking back and saying, okay, how about we take a step back? How about we reevaluate the portfolio? Let's let some of the, the purchases and sales level out. Let's let you know life catch up. Let's make sure the bookkeeping is where the bookkeeping needs to be, right? Really important. Um, I had a couple of people talking to me and saying like, hey, you know, like, how are you personally? And I thought I'm generally pretty good personally, but I'm always asking myself how I can be better. So like in those respects, that's what this year for me was for, which is why I turned to some lending and some consulting and some land development because, um, because I can speak these languages I think the most important thing for me this year was return on time. And frankly, like I'm not an engineer, I'm not a realtor, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a provincial land planner, I'm none of these things, I'm none of these designations, but it's my job to take what all these people do say and convert them into things that we call deals, Mm -hmm. right? And because I'm a professional nothing, land development for me is a really great opportunity because I can be the point man and I can speak that language, right? And it's a good return on time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think that's so important because... You can, like somebody like yourself, you've been involved in so many different deals. You've done so many uh, transactions, let's say, in in the real estate space. And again, maybe you don't realize sometimes how much stress you put on yourself. And you you got to take a step back sometimes, right? Yeah. You've been involved in this for over 10 years. So I guess that compounds over time, right? And make no mistake about it. Like I am leaving money on the table by taking a step back Mm -hmm. and doing some of the things that I'm doing. But I mean, like there's, there's different seasons in life for different things. Right. And you can have a season of like really going out there and doing as many flips as you can and growing the business and like growing the team and more properties and all this. Or you can say, hey, you know what? I think I just need to take six months and breathe. Yeah. And do a little traveling and spend some time at the cottage or, you know, go with my friends and family. Maybe you have a broken relationship with your kids. Right. That you have to fix because you've been so busy. Right. I don't have kids, so I don't have that problem. But yeah. some people do. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I think that that's important to really recognize because like at the end of it all, once you have your base necessities of life covered w- with cash flow, let's just say. Right. And whatever it costs you to live on an annual basis, maybe you go on a couple of vacations a year, you have a nice house and you can go out for dinner. I really do believe that the the definition of like financial freedom or luxury is just being able to go to a restaurant and not look at the price on a menu. Right. It doesn't mean you have to own an island. Right. In my opinion. Some people say I gotta have the island. And I'm like, cool. Buy the island. Yeah, yeah. Right? What's yeah, but for sure. Sometimes ordering two appetizers is pretty fulfilling too. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. And um, one thing you touched on when it came to burnout was, you know, taking a step back and thinking, why am I doing this? Did you have an opportunity to think about that, where you want to head in terms of your portfolio, your cash flow, all that that Mm -hmm. stuff? Yes, I'm still going through that now. It's like, okay, do I want to keep these 33 units and build them out and and own them? Knowing that I'm going to have to attribute the next 12 to 24 months of construction time right, to actually see this through to fruition and then have the vacancies filled and make sure that the foundations go in the right place, right? Um, do I want to sell it and take the cash and, and lend it? So I'm going through all of these, these, these thought processes right now. I look a lot at construction costs too. And I also look a lot at future outlook. And, you know, it's funny. I was looking at a budget, like a spreadsheet that I had before I came today for this reason, mm-hmm. because I wanted to talk about this. So a bag of rock salt in 2019 was 33 bucks. That same bag of rock salt, this is at Lowe's, same part number, same everything, mm. right? Is now 90 something dollars. Wow. Same bag. Yeah. Two years ago, pre COVID, three years ago, a uh, uh, two by four by eight stick of lumber was $2.10, mm-hmm. right? Today, that same thing, I looked at it before, like before I came in today, just to get the most updated pricing, was $4.15. Yeah. Right. So, and that's pretty low compared to what it was like, you know, two years ago or in, in when yep. there was that height of the shortage. I'll tell you something else. So when I built the triplex during COVID, Mm -hmm. I straddled the beginning of COVID towards the end. So I was kind of like, I was kind of in the mix there. I quoted this triplex uh, to build it prior to COVID and the lumber package was 20 grand. Mid COVID or like entry COVID, the lumber package, same building was 40 grand. Mm -hmm. By the time I built it, that lumber package was $60,000. Same building, Yeah. right? So you got to say, where does that come from? Because if lumber's doing that and insulation is doing that, copper wire is doing that, well, hang on a second here. What makes sense? Mm-hmm. So it's going to be really interesting to see, like, okay, how is this panning out? And what does that mean for inflation? Because if a new build costs more, that means existing product is going up too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And you can also, you can also see it just even at restaurants, you know, like yeah. sometimes when you walk in and you look at the menu and you just kind of think, with well, the this is like double what it was five years ago or whatever, yeah. you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. Everything's uh-huh. uh, way more. So maybe just, um, kind of a last thing to touch on here with higher rates. Um, I think a lot of investors are struggling with, um, managing their portfolio, the cash flow, and all that. Um, do you, do you have any kind of tips, anything you've gone through yourself to uh, offset some of the, I don't know if you have variable mortgages or whatnot, but uh, to kind I of do. offset, yeah, <laughs> offset some of the uh, losses in cash flow? Hmm. Yeah, it's a tough one because, I mean, really, your cash flow is tied to your debt. So, I mean, less debt means more cash flow, number yeah. one. So, I mean, not over leveraging in the first place is a really good place to be. I think if you can maybe exit some of the properties, if you don't think that over time, like over a, over a time horizon, uh, that's comfortable to you, uh, your property is going to be in a positive location or a positive uh, financial position. Maybe you exit that property now. Maybe you break even, but you get some cash back. Right. You know, and then you can change some of your debt or restructure. That's an option. Adding more units is an option. There's third units going into a lot of properties now. Maybe you do the third unit and you have a look at, okay, what's it going to cost for me to build this third unit out? Versus what is the rent that I'm going to receive worth, right? Versus if I refinance or don't refinance, how does that change my position? So, I mean, that's an opportunity as well. Uh, Perhaps if you're a solo investor with no partners and you have not so great financing, maybe you take on partners and they can get better financing than you can get. You free up an equity position, right, for that partner to come in. But thereby you get your capital back and you improve your cash flow because they can go with an A lender, whereas maybe you're private or with a B lender. Sure. That's an option too. I mean, there's lots of ways that you can do it. I'm not saying that we're going back to like 1.5% rates because that's a long ways off if they ever get there at all. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they raised rates today, another quarter percent. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's that's tough, but those are some of the ways that I'd look at it. Okay. And and you did mention uh, partners. So just out of curiosity, do you mm-hmm. work, do you have a lot of stuff with partners yourself or have you strayed away from no. that and kind of just... How you, your portfolio is yours. It's mostly mine. So of all of those 70 some odd deals, I think I've had a partner on like six mm. properties. Um, I had a partner earlier on. I got to think back now because it's been a while. Uh, I had a partner earlier on that helped me get over the hump because the way that CIBC at one time was qualifying mortgages, once you had three or more, they looked at your debt coverage ratio and less or so at your income. But I didn't have three or more. I only had two. Mm-hmm. And because I got laid off, I couldn't get over the hump. So I took on a partner that got me there, right? That was one opportunity. Uh, I had a, a couple other properties that I just, I was in the mix of doing deals and I didn't have the money to close on it myself. So I said, you know what, this is a great opportunity. Let's pull somebody else in. So I did that. But generally uh, I'm mostly solo. And I did that by the way of like 
buying properly. I don't think enough people buy correctly, mm-hmm. right? If you buy, Warren Buffett, famous quote, buy, buy $1 for 66 cents, right? Stocks, real estate, doesn't matter, cars, yeah. right? If you can buy a dollar for 66 cents or if you can buy a $500,000 house for uh, 400 grand or whatever, assuming that you're creative with the way that you finance and you're strategic, like you can own that house for free at some point if you can get the equity back out and you don't need a partner, right? And that's how I built my portfolio and that's how I did my whole thing mm-hmm. for all these years. You didn't need partners if you just bought right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess, well, moving forward for you, do you see yourself getting into bigger uh, bigger projects, you know, bigger land development deals, bigger yeah. uh, just buildings in general? Yeah, I think so. So, I mean, for me, I look at it, I look at it three ways. Land, structure, personal skill sets, and time. Right. So for the whole highest and best use thing, I look at the land first. What can we do with the dirt? Right. Can we rezone it? Can we sever it? Can we add more density? That's number one. Number two, I look at the structure. Is there an existing structure there? Can we renovate it? Should we renovate it? Does that have economic value or do we tear it down so we can put up something bigger? Right. That's number two. And then number three, what are you good at? Right. Personal skill sets and time. What do you have enough time to do? Um, I said this in the book. I said, if you're a duplex investor, you're probably not going to be building a hospital. And if you're investing in farms, you know, looking at triplexes is probably not for you either. Mm -hmm. So like pick what you're good at. I think that's super important. So for me, yes, I will look at bigger projects. I will say, where's the opportunity here? I'm looking at one right now. And it's a, it's a very much bigger project Mm -hmm. than what I've used, been used to doing. Right. But the same skill sets apply. And if you can speak those languages, it's really important that you attribute those languages to all of the various facets of real estate. Yeah, for sure. Um, Thank you for, for sharing all that and sharing about your future. Do you feel like there's any anything that we missed or anything important that you want to you want to share with the audience? Uh, I'd love for them to check out my book. I wrote a book called The Highest and Best Use Playbook. Uh, we talk about all of the things that we've talked about here today in that land development, uh, restructuring, personal growth, and then like personal skill sets and time, land, structures, all of these things. They're all in the book. I put it on Audible as well. So there's an audio Audible version that people can listen to. And uh, I did actually read it. There's about six or seven hours of content oh, cool. in there. So yeah, if you like to hear my voice, by all means. Go How was that? The, the process of uh, it was cool, man. recording yourself, your own book? I had no idea. Um, how it was going to go down. And I had some people tell me, oh man, it's going to be so tough. Like you're not going to be able to get through it. Because in the booth time, it's not eight hours continuous. It's like 24, yep. 30 hours of, of actually recording. And every time you move, if you brush your clothing wrong, if you cough, if your stomach gurgles, like the sound booth engineer hears that. Mm-hmm. Cut, start again. Yeah. Right? And the first day I left there so deflated because just... I'm not trained for this, right? I'm not, I'm not, I can platform speak, fine. Mm-hmm. But to read an audio book in a certain tone where you have to be very soft and yeah. people have to listen to your voice. Like it's, it's very, it's very different, right? It's an acquired skill. Just like a fine wine is an acquired taste. This is an acquired skill. So after the, about the second session, I got it. Mm-hmm. Right. And it became very fluid and we had a great time doing it. Um, obviously there was a cost attributed to record the book and get it up on audible and all of these things. But I mean, for somebody to be able to just go on there and download the book and they're like all of the photos that are in the book come in a PDF handout too. I think it's just the neatest process and to actually see your own work show up on your phone and show up on everybody's phone if they want it is a really cool feeling. So yeah, yeah. I hope people like it. So just out of curiosity, did you have to um, organize everything yourself, like studio time and all that? Or did, did you get some guidance from Audible or whatever? Audible does nothing. So Audible is a service provider. That's it, mm-hmm. right? So just like if somebody wants to sell lumber in Home Depot, Home Depot is like, cool, like bring us your lumber and we'll sell it, right? Audible is the same way. Bring us your product and we'll sell it. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is with Audible is that when you record, you have to meet their metrics. So they have a very specific standard on how something has to sound in order to meet their quality standards Mm -hmm. and like actually go out to the world. So I was gonna record it in my podcast booth and like have somebody edit it and just send it in. Mm -hmm. That would not have been okay, right? I thought, well, I spend the money when I have the setup, I've got the mic and it should be okay. No, not good. So I had to actually go to this booth, right? Sit down, they measure how far your, your, Uh, Your mouth is from the microphone, how far the mic is from the floor, where the chair is positioned. If you look around the room, there isn't a square wall in the entire facility because of the way that the audio sounds bounce and reflect Mm -hmm. off of the off the studio. Right. So like everything was engineered and it was just really cool. So when I would go back, I'd look for my tape marks on the floor and, and that's where I'd be positioned. And I would read the book and I'd read it off an iPad so you don't hear the flipping of a, mm-hmm. of a page, right? It was just, it was so dialed in through yourself. Yeah. 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 It was just so dialed in. It was really, yeah. really cool experience. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I always wondered how that was done. Cause you know, they all sound the same. All, all audiobooks kind of have that same, yes. same sound. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, cool. Uh, just to finish things off, um, best way to reach you and services you're providing. Yeah, Instagram at the highest and best use, Facebook, the highest and best use real estate. Uh, you can check all of this stuff out at the highest and best use.com. You get a VIP newsletter to sign up for, and you can get all the books and stuff there as well. So I'd love for people to sign up and check it out. Awesome, Ryan. I'll include all the information in the show notes. Thank you for coming by and sharing your story, and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Well Off Podcast. If you enjoy the show, then I'd really appreciate if you left us a review on iTunes and let us know your thoughts. In order for us to get a larger audience, it's really important to have reviews, so your support is extremely appreciated. And also, don't forget to share the podcast with your friends and family. Until next time, I'm George Almastri. Have a great day.